What's going on reefers? Blaine here, as you can see, back in the farm. And today we're gonna to be discussing an issue we see in the reef hobby all across the nation, all across the world. We're gonna be talking about dinoflagellates. These are an issue that we see a ton of reef creepers actually get out of the hobby due to. We're gonna also be talking about how there's a ton of different ones that you need to be able to identify and then you can rectify. This is a huge issue in our reef tanks and we wanna do what we do here at Top Shelf Aquatics by building you up helping you out and teaching you ways you can help your reef tank become a successful reef at home. We're gonna get right into things, get all about into dinos. Let's dive in. To get where we are now, where we're actually talking about dinos, we need to understand the root of the problem. How did we get there in the first place? How did we get dinos into our reef tank? And how can we help identify them and figure out how we can fix them. Of course, we need to identify what was the root cause of this problem. Some of the main contributing factors that can play into dino outbreaks are the following. New tank syndrome, potentially an immature or lacking biodiversity in your new tank. Nutrient reduction tools such as organic carbon dosing, excess biomedia in a tank, algae filtration, and GFO. Rarely is it ever going to be just one of these things that I just mentioned, but I wanted to let you know excess nutrient control is really going to be one of the biggest reasons why we're going to see dino outbreaks occur in our tanks. Obviously, we've talked about the idea of being able to identify these dinos and that way you can get to the root of your issues. Obviously, not every single one of us at home is going to have a microscope that we can utilize to be able to see exactly what species of dino we're dealing with. I want to let you know, if you guys don't have the access to this kind of equipment, if you're just trying to figure out how you can fix your dino situation, the best thing is not wait. Don't wait at all. Get right to it. And what can you start do is you can start throwing everything at the wall with these dinos, right? You can start focusing on a blackout, maybe utilization of UV, phytodosing. There's a lot of different things that you can do just by throwing it at the wall and trying to combat these problems before you're able to maybe identify them with a microscope or things like that. Obviously not every single one of us is gonna have a farm set up like this, gonna have the ability to have access to all these smart-minded reef keepers or just the ability to have access to a lot of high technology equipment. Now, if you don't have the access to all those things, what you can do though is be proactive and get right into the problem and don't wait. All right, we are here with Corey, our farm manager here at Top Shelf Aquatics. I want to say thank you, Corey, for hopping on with us. Absolutely. Talking about dinos. As, as I mentioned earlier, you know, talk a lot about the idea of, you know, misconception, misidentification, right? And Corey's been someone that really has hammered this a lot in the farm and has told me a lot too, you know, that's the biggest thing with dinos that a lot of people aren't understanding is understanding there's so many, you know, genuses and different things that people are going to run into that, you know, if you don't really identify, it's going to be hard to be able to understand and go through your problem, right? So you even make the problem worse. Right. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to break them down. We've got five that we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the first one, Osreopsis, which is probably the most common in the aquarium hobby. Let's talk a little bit about that. Some of the ways you can identify it. You know, I've told everybody before, you know, having a microscope, if you have the ability to get to that, utilizing one of those, what can you see to be able to identify them? And what's some ways that we can kind of combat that? Right, with Osteopsis, it's definitely the one we see most commonly. Um, it's also one of the easiest to identify under the microscope because it has a teardrop shaped shell to it. Okay. Um, and they also have a specific type of movement that almost looks like something spinning. Gotcha. Um, when you look at them under the scope. Um, unfortunately, they're one of the more toxic varieties. So some people do experience some big issues with that, which is why when treating Osteopsis, it's always recommended to have carbon running on the system with whatever treatment you decide to go with. And the most effective by far for this genus is using a UVC sterilizer. Gotcha. Okay. I always recommend at least using a UV sterilizer that's at least one watt per three gallons of system volume. Um, however, the bigger the better and the bigger the quicker you're gonna see that probably be eliminated. Some people do recommend actually plumbing directly in and out of the actual affected display. Um, while as this does definitely speed up the results you're gonna get and eliminate the problem faster, it's not absolutely needed. Um, I know you mentioned it was toxic too in nature. Is that gonna affect also your cleanup crew? I know this it is- It can, yes. Dinos that's, are one that of those is things. one of the things that, um, 
With cleanup crew, it could you're definitely gonna see snails be affected by it. Um, some people even go as far as, as soon as they have identified that it's Osteopsis, that they'll go ahead and pull their cleanup crew um, temporarily just to kind of save on any snail deaths. Obviously, you don't want a bunch of snails dying in For a reef sure. tank. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, we'll keep on moving forward and we'll move on to our next one. Let's start talking about Prorocentrum. Prorocentrum. Love the name. Kind of an easier name to say. I know <laughs> we've been talking about all these names all week long. I've been butchering them. I probably continue to butcher them. Corey's yeah. going to help me out with that. But let's talk about Prorocentrum. Prorocentrum. Um, so under microscope, this dinoflagellate uh, almost looks like a coffee bean in a way. Um, its shell has a kind of an indentation right on the top of it. And a lot of times you'll actually see the nucleus of the cell, depending on what stage it's in. Um, and this one is a little trickier than Osteopsis to get rid of. Uh, there's a lot of different methods people can use. Um, a lot of people seem to experience this one as being one of the more nutrient sensitive ones. Okay. It's one of the ones that'll typically show up when you get bottomed out nutrients mm -hmm. and that's where people experience them. So again, with this one, raising your nutrient levels as well as maybe even dosing a silicate based uh, additive such as uh, sponge excel by bright wild aquatics is a great one and that way you encourage a competing diatom bloom that'll help eliminate and outcompete this uh this dinoflagellate okay and then you know we're just going to keep it rolling we've got them going the next one on our list it's two in part right we have the large and the small cell i'm going to go for it Amphi Amphibidinium. Amphibidinium. There it is, right there. Amphibidinium. So, okay. Um, yeah, so, Latin's fun. It is. And so you said the large cell's the more common. More common of the two, you're experience. But the yeah. small cell is obviously one dino that we will see in some aquarium situations, but right. it's the large cell is definitely the more of the common of the two. Yes, definitely more common. Um, the small cell can sometimes be a little trickier to treat. However, what we've seen with the uh, large cell um, amphibidinium, it's really good to come at it with a multi prong approach. Um, UVC sterilizer can maybe help a little bit, but it's not going to be an instant cure-all like it would be with Osteopsis. Right. Um, really recommend, um, in addition to doing things like raising nutrient levels and dosing maybe a silicate to create a, a competing diatom bloom. One of the things we've noticed in these past couple of years, um, that people have really good luck with raising the temperature of their reef tank mm. a tiny bit. However, this needs to be done very carefully and obviously with a, a really trusted means of measuring temperature as many of the cheaper digital thermostats and things like that can be quite a few degrees off. For sure. Um, we recommend don't going any higher than 83 and obviously doing this very slowly and watching all your tanks inhabitants and looking out for signs of stress. Most people see good effects when they hold a sustained temperature of 82 with getting rid of the large cell amphibidinium. Gotcha, and then would you recommend maybe like a degree a day kind of increase or over the that course would be, maybe that would a be couple acceptable. more days? And I, I should have thrown this in there um, that identifying this one under the scope yeah. is uh, they have a somewhat, a close shape to a, uh, to Prorocentrum okay. is the coffee bean. However, what you want to look for with this one a distinguishing feature is the opening of, of the flagella of this dinoflagellate. Some people say it almost looks like a beak okay. of a bird. Um, and when you look at it from one angle and from the side, you can almost see distinguished, um, I almost want to call it a Pac-Man. Okay. Um, okay. Pac-Man with a closed mouth. Mm -hmm. um, those are the identifying traits for the uh, for amphibidinium. Gotcha. And then we've worked our way through. We're on our last one now. Coolia is the last Coolia. one we're going to talk about. I think it's not one that's it's super not, common, but it's, it's not as commonly experienced, you know, in the hobby. I've only seen it a handful of times. Gotcha. And, um, it is a spherical shaped dinoflagellate. So okay. under a microscope, its shell shape is you know very circular, as opposed to Osteopsis, which is more of a teardrop. However, when treating Coolia, uh, it's really best to try to mirror uh, the same treatment protocol as you would for uh, Osteopsis, which in UVC sterilizers are going to be your biggest asset in treating Coolia. Um, again, bacterial supplements can help as well. Um, but again, with any dinoflagellate, it's important, in my opinion, to come at it with a multi prong approach. Um, we've always had good success with not just doing one thing, it's always great to do two or three things at once to try to get rid of the problem where we see success. For sure. Well, Corey, thank you so much. You know, obviously being the farm manager here, everyone watching from at home, you know, I know they appreciate everything you do for the hobby, bringing all this amazing corals to us, but I want to say thank you again. Thanks for jumping on. Absolutely. Talking dinos and I'll let you get to it.
Dinos can be an extremely interesting topic in our reef aquariums. And like I said earlier, this is one of the biggest problems in the reef aquarium hobby that makes most people shut down their tanks. Here at Top Shelf Aquatics, we wanna provide you the proper knowledge and ways of treatment so you guys can maintain your reef tanks for long durations of a time. Thank you again to Corey and everyone else here in the farm for helping out on the videos, dropping in a bunch of information, and being able to take care of these amazing corals that we provide to the entire United States. I wanna say thank you guys so much for tuning in. If you guys have any extra questions regarding dinos, drop them down in the comments below, and we'll try to head you in the right direction. If you have done so already, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell notification so you don't miss out on any future uploads.